Welcome to Santa Barbara Talks with Josh Molina. It's such a pleasure today to be here with my colleague and friend, Jerry Roberts of Newsmakers with JR. And we are launching a series of interviews and conversations with candidates who are running for office in 2024. And today we're less than, oh, 60 days away from the March 5th primary. And we are with Frank Trois who is running for third district Santa Barbara County supervisor. And I think this is going to be a fantastic conversation. I know I've been looking forward to talking to Frank and Jerry and I have some questions that will hopefully inform the populace and the voters and we'll get a great idea of who Frank Trois is uh, with this conversation. First, Jerry, welcome. Frank Trois, welcome. How are you doing today? Thank you, sir. Yeah. Oh, Jerry, you go ahead. I'm sorry. I didn't mean this. Well, I'm, 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 I'll say thank you. I won't say sir, but I'm fine. <laughs> well said. And happy new year to you both. And thank you both for making time today. I really appreciate the opportunity. Yes. Thank you, Frank. So let's start. I'll go first, Jerry. Uh, I just want to ask you, Frank, tell us about yourself and your, your bio. This political game that people play, it's a lot of times people we've heard of who've run for office in the past and you're kind of a newcomer to this political realm. So tell us about yourself. What, what's your bio? What's your story? Uh, well, thank you for that. And 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 at the risk of giving you a an abridged version, which which I'm going to have to uh, have to do. Ironically, uh, Santa Barbara County was actually part of the catalyst for me to move overseas. About 14, I believe it was 14 years ago, we were doing some work for the county uh, for SB SERS. And this was when everything was collapsing around uh, the great financial crisis. And as a consequence of that work, uh, we actually garnered international recognition. So the proposals that we, we did here in Santa Barbara were critical relative to the pension. And the government of Singapore reached out. And at the time, they were looking at building an ecosystem in what we now call fintech. And... Uh, gave me my family the opportunity to move over there about 13, 14 years ago. We did. And fast forwarding through that, we had the opportunity to build the leading investment bank in Southeast Asia for fintech, which was very, very exciting. So things today that you we all take for granted, we're, we're actually coming out of Asia, but uh, things uh, in, in terms of commission-free trading, uh, Uber, and you know, which, which, again, I can tell you a number of stories. Uh, insure tech, et, et cetera. We were part of that wave uh, on both sides of the pond in Southeast Asia and here in the States. About four years ago, I was ready to punch my ticket and retire. So this would have been the third time I was going to do it. And I got the bug uh, for a number of reasons, not the least of which was the kids, to start taking a look at climate and, and work in climate and sustainability. So four years ago, we expanded our remit as a firm. Uh, we have 54 individuals in our firm and started doing more of that work, and uh, which is also incredibly fascinating, which I can talk about. And, uh, and there, there you have it. So today we've now expanded from being an investment bank. We're now a merchant bank. Uh, we have offices in Southeast Asia, here in the States and in Switzerland. So that's what we've been up to. Great. And you lived in the San Ynez Valley uh, for, for how long before you, you moved 13, 14 years ago? We bought the place here. It was funny. My wife and I were comparing notes. Ironically, we bought the place up in San Inez right around 01, just after 9-11. Uh, so we made the decision that that for a number of reasons, um, we didn't want the kids growing up in Los Angeles. And San Inez was just perfect. You know, I'm, I'm a product of New York public schools. So the idea of the kids hanging around with cows and horses was completely foreign to me, but it was wonderful to see them doing it. And, and uh uh, and they had a great childhood up here. We couldn't have been happier with with how they were brought up. Yeah. Great. Frank, let me start uh, in terms of the this uh, race, uh, this campaign. Um, you know, it's hard to beat an incumbent, uh, as you know. Uh, they, they have a lot of advantages uh, built in. Uh, so it's kind of the first thing I think any challenger needs to do is to make the case against the incumbent. Why should the voters basically fire that person? Uh, can you give us uh, your take on uh, how you think Supervisor Hartman has done, and what you would, uh, how you would be different? That's a great question, Jerry. And and there's two things there. And one thing I want to make sure that we do touch on today that that uh, despite the the local pundits and, and other commentators and narrators around around the primary, 
this election will be done March 5th. And, and, and I want to be clear on that. This will not go to November. And it's interesting, if, if the three of us just take a simple step back, and if we do the back of the napkin math, the part one, when I was first looking at this, and let's just assume that I'm reasonably good at math and I make a decision that's reasonably informed, uh, the math penciled out that the incumbent would lose. And it, there were for a number of reasons, not the least of which was the redistricting. Uh, Underneath that was an incredible amount of frustration regarding status quo and what was not going to change. Now, in and of itself, that, that, that was interesting to me to say, okay, the statistics support the fact that the incumbent will lose. But the other statistic, and I think, you know, Josh, I didn't answer your question earlier. Why am I running? Okay, so I'm not a politician. You two know that. You could have a field day with me here today in terms of what I don't, you know, you guys have forgotten more about politics than I would even pretend to remember. The counties broke again. A year ago, I was shown the numbers that was indicating that the county from a budget perspective in terms of revenues was starting to go off the edge of the earth again. The county CEO and the board of supervisors were debriefed, I think it was four to six weeks ago, where the budget is going to present a shortfall over the next 36 to 48 months, which means that for the three of us, status quo or worse. And the interesting thing is all the constituents know that. You know, in their in their in their DNA, they know that that's a problem. So the initial decision, Jerry, was to say, okay, folks are annoyed, they're done, they're scared about what tomorrow looks like because we're we're walking off a precipice again, uh, and the statistics regarding the redistricting also point to that. The fascinating thing about your question, people have asked me, what have I thought about Janelle entering the race? To be very candid, I know that there were a lot of people who were upset about that, and we can talk about that. I actually think it's fantastic that she's in the race. And for me, it was another data point to say, again, going back to the Mickey Mouse math, if, and again, I'm grotesquely oversimplifying this, but if Janelle's lone poke, if I'm the, if I'm the Republican vote in this election, you have 66% of the district constituents saying the incumbent needs to go, period, full stop. So there, that's what I took great comfort in, Jerry, in terms of what, how the numbers penciled out. And, and regrettably, uh, and I say this respectfully in terms of the incumbent, th the opposition knows that and they understand that. And this is something right now that they're having a very, very difficult time wrestling with. And in terms of how you would assess her, uh, Supervisor Hartman's uh, performance, uh, you know, you say people aren't happy with the status quo. Could you could you just elaborate on that a little bit? Well, you know that, and, and I want to say this in deference to the incumbent. She's not. I'm not running against her. I'm I'm running against, and I say this respectfully. And and actually, I have great admiration for for the party. It's very well organized, very well structured. It's a machine. You know, I have to tip my hat to it. It's this a, would it's, be the Democratic Party. You're absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. You know, I, I can levy more than enough criticism regarding the Republican Party in terms of what they can and can't do. However, the Democratic Party is a machine. And the hard point here, Jerry, that I've been bringing up to folks, I'm running against ourselves. That's <laughs> who I'm running up against. And behind that, I'm running against Mary Rose. So if we're really going to call this as it is, that is who the opposition is. And that is a big part of the narrative regarding Janelle's entry into the race. And we can talk about that. But to your point on the record, and I, and I would say something here and forgive me, I'm going to cross the Rubicon on this. The Democrats in this county have to start asking really, really hard questions, whether or not the machine, whether or not Darcel is truly representing the traditional values and ideals of the Democratic Party. And I would argue, and I would argue very, very strongly on this, in terms of climate and the environment, non-existent, absolutely non-existent. And the vote on the pipeline was, was absolutely proof positive in, in that regard. And part two, Jerry, Darcel will do anything to get that candidate through the shoot. The game she's playing right now is between this and Roy and Dawson the first and, and, and all of that. So she, she's looking at a broader chessboard. But here, there are things that they have done which do not... They're not Democrat in, in, in terms of the values and beliefs of the party. So I feel that the constituents here in the district, if they took a hard look, all you see is a, is a machine that's simply perpetuating the ability to stay in office and, and be in control. But I'm not running against the incumbent. With all due respect, I think years ago when she first sat in the chair, 
She had aspirations about what she could do. And I think that dream left probably within 48 hours of her sitting in the chair. All right. Thank you. Oh, okay, Frank. Uh, wow. Some precise pinpoint answers there. That's great. You're going to get the party all fired up with those comments. Um, let me go back to a uh, little bit about Soho Capital, because as I've been uh, covering this and you know what I've been hearing the last few months from people who are saying, oh, Frank can't win, Frank's this, Frank's that, um, they, they often throw a lot of commentary towards Soho Capital and the fact that, oh, he's this billionaire, you know, he's this multimillionaire, he hasn't been here, you know. Can you talk a little bit about specifically your, your professional job? You mentioned it already. Um, does that make you out of touch with like your everyday Trader Joe's grocery shopper here? Um, talk about the work that you do and why voters should say, yeah, that, that work really matters when we want to elect somebody. No, it's a Josh, that's that's a great, great question. And I was smiling as as uh, you were going through some of that, because we actually have uh, with the campaign, we actually have a quote board where we put down all of the rumors and 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 points that people brought up. But, but the best one that I've heard so far is that apparently I own a warehouse of pesticides in, in Lompoc. So apparently I'm, I'm trying to, uh, for, for whatever reason, uh, that was on the board. Look, I'm very flattered about the comments. And I think the quandary that folks are in right now, especially if I go back to Darcel, Darcel's quandary right now is that she only has three options, you know, relative to some of the commentary that you're hearing. Part one, she has to portray me as a MAGA Republican. Okay, so if I was in her shoes, that's the first thing I would say. And 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 again, you guys should feel free. I was asked and told by every consultant who who we no longer work with in terms of the initial group. We brought in a whole new group. They told me don't declare as a Republican. Huge mistake to do that. I said nope. We're going to go as a Republican. We're not going to be a hypocrite in in regards to that. Darcel's challenge in terms of portraying me as a Republican. If, and to your point, I'm glad you did the research. I'm technically a Biden appointee for the Export-Import Bank of the United States. I am technically the most bipartisan candidate that's ever run in this election in terms of sitting on both sides of the aisle. So taking that aside, then part two, to your point, if, if this was a normal supervisor election, Josh, I think I would agree with the points that you raised. And what there's two things that I've highlighted to folks. One, I'm a one-term supervisor. I'm not interested in doing this a second time at all. Not, not at all. Part two, I am absolutely not interested in being a caretaker supervisor. This campaign has three messages, revenue, revenue, revenue. So to your point, have I had a good run doing my day job? Absolutely. I could talk forever about it and, and I could name bomb back and forth. However, the single biggest problem facing the county today is that revenue shortfall in the budget. It's been disclosed and it's been disseminated and none of my, with all due respect to the other candidates running, there is no platform, no plan, no game plan, no strategy, no vision that takes Santa Barbara County out of the shortfall, which right now looks like it'll be about 10 to $15 million per annum conservatively in, in terms of what the county's looking at. So to your point, Josh, if this was, if we were in a surplus and it, and if this was something where we could, uh, you know, argue about the football teams or the baseball teams, or what have you, I'm absolutely not the guy, you know, and, and, and I would put that out there now. This county's in crisis and, and it needs someone there that can help it solve that problem. Hey, Frank, I, I just want to define the terms a little bit because, you know, when we talk about public budgets, there's, you know, deficits and shortfalls and debts and everything. So are you are you talking specifically about a uh, a, a systemic built in structural uh, shortfall that that the, the county has? Are you talking about a one time uh, uh, deficit of the year or what? What are we what are we talking about specifically? Yeah. And actually, Jerry, I'm glad you asked that because I and forgive me, I'm I'm not I'm doing this on purpose, but I'm not. But it's actually going to be recurrent. So and it's the reason why I was saying over the next 36 to 48 months. So the the for the folks on public safety who are already under resourced in, in terms of what they need, they're already looking at you're not going to get the people you need. You're not going to get the adjustment in overtime hours that you need. You're not going to get any of the infrastructure, none of the resources that you need. You're just going to have to make do and it will get worse over, over the next 12, 24, 36 months. And, and here, what, what I find interesting, Jerry, is what we're proposing on the revenue side isn't complicated. This isn't me having a cup of coffee you know, and saying, oh, I just have a, an idea. As we began talking with the community, what's fascinating is when you look at Santa Barbara, Santa Barbara at the end of the day is actually a real estate company. 
you know, if you look at the three primary drivers of revenue, if the three of us were the board of supervisors, we'd say property taxes, sales taxes, and transient fees. That's it. You know, we have had some other stuff around the edges. So if you, the three of us were going to move the needle, we would say, this is a real estate company. We're not going to open up a bunch of restaurants. We're not going to open up a bookstore. That's not going to, we need to start leaning into real estate. And here, a big part of our proposal to the county is, is regarding unlocking that, bringing that revenue into the system on a recurring basis, and then obviously get rid of the shortfall. And hopefully we can tweak around the edges in terms of some process issues. So how do you do that? How do you how do you uh, uh, boost property tax? Well, you know, it's the funny part was when I was talking to uh, some of the realtors, I had to be careful because it was like, wait a minute, are you going to make tax rates higher? That, that that doesn't work for us. Believe it or not, and I and I want to be careful that I don't vilify these folks because I think everybody in the county is trying to do the best they can with limited resources, and it just gets harder and harder year over year especially now that we have an inflationary environment. And on top of that, we're saying you don't have the same money you had last year. So you know, normally there'd be some type of an inflationary adjustment. I'll give you a good example. And this was something that's, excuse me, stood out to me. If we look at planning and development, okay, tongue in cheek, the three of us were to do a remodel on our house, flip a coin, how long that approval is going to come through and, and get done. There are right now well over $3 billion of approved projects, projects that were already approved and vetted in the system, stuck in planning and development that won't come out of that for 12 to 14 years. Think about that. That's $30 million a year if we just lock that in, just that number in terms of the property taxes coming in from that. And as, as somebody once said to me, he goes, you know, look, I understand we're a slow growth county and I get that. Planning and development should not be a roadblock in this process. We're planning and development has become a force multiplier <laughs> relative to slow growth. So it's one thing for you know the three of us with the supervisors to say, all right, you know what? We're, we're, as a matter of policy and slow growth, we're going to say it's 12, 12 months. But the system, you know, and I was stunned when I heard how long it was for this stuff to get through. So the, the irony here, I would say as a county, and here you have a Republican, and Jerry, feel free to rip me apart on this, you have a Republican now saying we need to make the bureaucracy more efficient and we probably need to give the bureaucracy more resources. I genuinely believe these people are trying to do the best they can with what they have. They just don't have enough. They simply don't have enough. So that alone, to me, is, is one of the simplest things we can do to start to unlock that value here in the county. And what about the other two uh, you mentioned uh, in terms of the uh, sales tax and the uh, transit tax of course, you left out the massive cannabis tax, which is just a printing printing money. As yes, we well, we, well, regrettably, I don't have a bourbon here with me. I only have a cup of tea, but we can we can talk about that as well. Let me let me give you something else that's hypothetical, and I'm going to pick on another journalist here because he actually did a great job covering this, and that's Nick over at the Independent. Nick Nick did a, a, a chamber meeting with some of the technology leadership here in Santa Barbara County. I, I I laugh. Our firm now is actually hiring from UCSB. So I, I tease some of the folks on the Republican side said, look, you took Isla Vista out. We're actually a big employer now. We, we, can, we can really use those votes coming in. The irony of this is we are so already rich in terms of you've got Google here, you've got Microsoft here. You know, we, we talk about SpaceX forever. What have all of them told us they want? They want a bigger footprint here in the county. They want to expand here in the county. And so Nick, when he put on this, uh, it was an event with the chamber, they had a great article on it. You had every single technology leader say, we need a campus, we need corporate development, and we need housing for our employees so that they can afford to stay here. So one of the things we have in our proposal, Jerry, is, is actually a tech campus, which we've already vetted with these counterparts. And we've said, all right, what if we built a tech campus up in Lompoc? You know, and again, and I'll send this to you. I, I'm, this is not hypothetical. I will send you a link to the file where we have this brought out. That in and of itself is another 100 to 150 million per annum in terms of property taxes, sales taxes, and when you include also the housing development that would have to occur for those employees to be there. And with all due respect to the folks at Google and Microsoft, if I was to have a neighbor, I'd, I'd be okay with you know an engineer and two kids living next door. I, I think that's a perfect addition for the community here in Santa Barbara. Yeah, sorry, Josh. I jumped. Uh, I jumped the queue there with my question. <laughs> no, no, that's great. Um, Jerry and I want to ask you a few policy questions, so let's sure. pivot there. Uh, let's talk about Santa Barbara County and housing. We know that the county was uh, working very hard to update its housing element 
like a, many organ, many agencies, they uh, miss the deadline, but uh, now they're in a place where they're going to be talking about rezoning. Part of this discussion is rezoning ag land to build new housing. And there's a lot of controversy around this. Initially, the, city, the, the county did not propose developing on its own sites, the land that it owns. It was all ag. There was some pushback from the community. Let's start big. What is your view on, on housing and the state pressures? Do we need more housing? Do we need uh, housing that is for the middle income? What is your viewpoint here as a candidate when you're trying to answer the question of so many people commuting from out of the area to work here and they can't afford to live here? That's a great question. And, and, and let me begin with, with bifurcating that two ways. Uh, and I hope we talk about energy, and I and I hope you you gentlemen feel free to ask me some direct questions regarding the pipeline. Here we are as a county where we are more than happy to pick a fight with Exxon, where Exxon is has infinite capital, infinite resources. Exxon has, as I was last told, more attorneys at their disposal than Gavin Newsom does for the entire state of California in terms of the resources that they can bring to bear to a problem. So the county, in its wisdom has chosen to pick a fight with Exxon. On the flip side, Josh, to your point on the housing, if we look at what happened in Lompoc in terms of the battle there over housing, if we look at what's happening right now in Goleta, and again, I'm grotesquely oversimplifying this, the community's telling you what it doesn't want to have happen, okay? It doesn't want that. It, it, and this is, a, this is a third rail, and the community has been crystal clear. And here's the irony. You have Goleta saying, don't put it here. You have Lompoc saying we want it here. Again, I'm, I'm, I'm grotesquely oversimplifying the problem. And you know what surprised me? And the reason why I started with Exxon, everyone was a wilting flower regarding Sacramento. And part of this is, as I was talking with folks, I was like, you're picking a fight with one of the largest MNCs in the world, yet you're a wilting flower when it comes to pushing back on Sacramento because you're quote unquote worried about sanctions. It's like, no. You know, you need to push back on this issue. You not, this is not a fait accompli as far as the community is concerned. You do have leverage in, in this discussion. And what's happening, in fact, to me, the, the, I apologize for this, the greatest insult that I saw to the county, and again, actually it was a great application in terms of its development, but there was a real estate game that was done where, where you as a member of Goleta, you could do the zoning for your area. And it's like, is, is, is it come to this, excuse me, this grotesque overless simplification to try to get everybody to drink the same Kool-Aid. And yet you have the community, they've been crystal clear what, what they don't want. So here, I think, candidly, I think this is a lapse of responsibility on the on the behalf of the supervisors and their fear of actually confronting Sacramento and saying, no, you know, that this isn't going to work. We're going to have to come up with another solution. And, and the hard part here, and I'll stop here, the hard part for me, going back, not to oversimplify it, Property taxes to me equal better schools, period. That's the correlation in my mind. That's the trade-off that people are giving me when they push back on housing. You're telling me by consequence, you are 100% comfortable with the impact that's having to our kids. Simple. That, that's, that's how I draw the, and to me, that's unacceptable. We're, I'm, I'm done having that discussion with the school heads and the kids. So are you saying you'd lead some sort of uh, county board effort to, to sue the state or, or push back against their mandates or what would you do if, if they're not a wilting flower? What should they be? Oh, absolutely. You know, and it's funny. I, I, I look at lawsuits as a cost of doing business. So I, I would have no issue at all. And again, if, if we're going to pick a fight with Exxon, to me, Sacramento is the junior team. That's the B team. So if we're comfortable fighting in the big leagues against that, that entity, then Sacramento to me is like, it, it's a, it, that's a B league game. And we should lean into that as hard as we can. But, but just accepting it? No, that's not acceptable to me at all. So they're having this discussion about rezoning, for example, the Glen Annie Golf, Golf Club. You yeah. know, they met with these developers ahead of time to say, hey, if we rezone the land, will you develop or sell for development? And, you know, you mentioned the tool. The tool, tool is such a joke, by the way. It's like, oh, help us figure out where to build the housing by going through this interactive tool when they've already decided what exactly. to do. It's like opinions didn't matter then, but now play with this interactive tool. But I mean, you can't obviously turn back the clock. I mean, do you support rezoning the Glen Annie Golf Club for, for housing or the no. San Marcos grower sites? Or I mean, what's your take? Now, I, 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 I think here, the 
And, and you know, it's the, the tricky part here is how much of this is done. So we, we could also talk about like the lawsuit on the ambulance side as well. The the as someone once said to me, they said, look, when you win, you're going to walk into a bag of you know what. It, it's just there waiting for you. I think the hard part here is to look the community in the eye and say, look, some of this is done. Some horrible mistakes were made to get us to here, but let's draw the line in the sand. Stop it. And then let's have a, a hopefully a civil conversation with Sacramento to say this is not going to work and we need to do something else. And, and the last thing, Jerry, then I'll let you go. You know, you say you're running against Darcel, right? And so the whole talking points among all the party people is vehicle, miles traveled, and we have to get people living near transportation lines. We have to get them out of their cars, taking the bus, riding their bikes, and it's destroying the planet if they're coming in from Oxnard, Ventura, Lompoc, Santa Maria, Buellton. So let's build the housing where the jobs are. And can you address that that philosophy, that perspective from your candidacy? Uh, I would say politely to Darcel, she's giving a, a graduate course in greenwashing. So the ability to label a climate solution on top of a very complex underlying problem. I mean, there, there, she could give a, she should do coursework at graduate schools for, for what she's doing right now. I think that's absolutely ridiculous to, to wrap it in a climate banner uh, around that. And the reality is the people who live here are telling you what they want, period, full stop. You know, and they're telling you where they're happy with the development and where they'd like to see that development. So no, I I, I think it's greenwashing 101. Uh, Frank, uh, uh, let me go back to the, uh, to the Exxon thing that you've mentioned a couple of times. <clears throat> uh, because I think as a practical matter, that could be, you know, the, perhaps the, um, the biggest change we would see uh, if uh you took the seat now occupied by by Joan Hartman would be on the issue of energy and and so on. Now she voted against the Exxon Mobil pipeline, the the new pipeline proposal. She recused herself on the uh, repairing the uh, the old pipeline as well. Where would you have been on those two issues? <laughs> so, Jerry, you waited a little bit for the hard questions. Good for you. We got through some of the appetizers. Now we're getting to dinner. I think that's great. Um, so I'm going to give you a black and white answer, and it's not going to be a political answer. And, and, and in deference to my Republican colleagues who are listening to this and probably going to fast forward to just this part of the broadcast to hear this, uh, let me give you the answer first. And if I can, if I could backfill, uh, I, I would appreciate it. My answer would have been no. I would have voted against the pipeline in terms of the way that it was presented at that time. And if I was in the chair as supervisor, I would have voted no on the pipeline, clear as day. And I now rationalize that. Go for it. All right. Now you're running for office. You can rationalize anything. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Thank you. You give me much more credit than I'm due. Here's here's the interesting thing as it relates to Darcel. She did two things to me that were intriguing uh, when the incumbent was was running for her last race. One, you know, we'll we'll get into some of the January six. Uh, uh, embracement that that occurred, and we can we can talk about that later relative to Bruce's campaign. Here, the pipeline, what was so fascinating to me was to hear Das at the end of this, forgive me, they wasted everybody's time over the day. You had the community come out, you had the unions come out. Everybody knew that Darcel had structured this where the incumbent was going to recuse herself from the vote. So it was a complete and utter waste of time. Das, at the end of it, I think, as you recall, quote unquote, the county was unable to act in, in this regard. Here's, here's the irony of this to me as, as it relates to this. First and foremost, the incumbent's estate is not adjacent to the pipeline. Exxon knows this. The constituents know this. Her estate is not adjacent to the pipeline. So the rationale for her not showing up, I can't believe that she did that without somebody telling her, you need to go. And we need to come up with some reason for you not to be there as part of this vote. So part one, why am I able to vote no? My estate is next door to El Rancho. My estate is next door to my neighbor where I have a cold beer and listen to the high school football game. I do not have a pipeline near my estate. Okay, so first and foremost, I can take the vote. Part two, which is more important here, the three of us, we just said earlier, here's Exxon that has more attorneys than the entire state of California has at its disposal. So Newsom can't even do battle with these guys. They're an absolute behemoth. We're putting five individuals who had no private sector experience at all, at all, or at a bare minimum, 
we're putting them up against this organization and saying, you negotiate on our behalf. So that that in and of itself, Jerry, if I was interviewing for a job and I said, we're going to put up the, our C team against this, this entity, you'd fire me. You'd just say, you're out of your mind. I don't even know why you're doing this. To your point, how should we have done this? First and foremost, we have the legal, financial, and advisory firepower in this county. There are some attorneys here that are phenomenal who've done infrastructure, project finance, et cetera, who Exxon themselves would acknowledge, I respect that. You're, you're putting me in front of someone who can actually negotiate a deal. Part two, as a climate banker, let me give another hard truth to this. When you're talking about climate, you're talking about climate transition, you have to sit across the table from people you don't like. You have to sit there with oligarchs You have because they control the assets. Exxon hasn't, forgive me for getting geeky here, and I'm getting a little long in the tooth, Exxon hasn't marked the asset to zero. It has a value. The reason why they haven't marked it to zero is somebody has already done the math and figured out we, and I'm not pulling this out of nowhere. This, this is, and I'm encouraging you to investigate this. Exxon knows the county will exhaust its legal claims in seven to 10 years. They've already done that math. So it gives them the ability to say, all right, we have a cost of doing business as it relates to this useless exercise of the county suing us and just trying to delay this process versus we know in seven to 10 years, we're going to be able to turn everything back on again. Okay. So for me, I look at this and I say, all right, we had the opportunity with the client, with the pipeline vote that came to the county. Nobody gave it any thought at all. Nobody gave any thought to the leverage to truly grab Exxon by the throat and say, you need to give a massive incentive for the county to do this. And it's not, by the way, it's not just going back to what the money you were giving schools. It's a function of what else are we going to ask you for? And here I would say to you sarcastically, this, this is I'm not interested in a $250,000 basketball scholarship fund for the, the team in Goleta. Those facilities, once they're firing, create billions of dollars for Exxon in terms of what's there. And every day we wait, we lose the leverage of having a hard conversation with them because I've run it. This is perverse. The more that we talk to them now, the more money we have the potential to obtain. So for example, what would I have asked for in lieu of saying no? My next ask would have been, Tell me exactly how many union jobs you're going to create. Okay. Now, again, as a Republican, I just said something heretical. How many union jobs are you going to create? And part two, we need help in Lompoc because that's probably where they're going to live. Our last back of the napkin estimate was it was 700 jobs, seven to 800 jobs were going to be uh, created as a function of that going on. Part two, tell me specifically, I want you to be paying taxes again at equal or higher rates than you did before. And as a function of that, back to what we said on property taxes contributing to schools, give the schools the money that they used to have, give them the ability to build the infrastructure. I mean, San Inez High School, it's ridiculous. The sidewalk is a, is a war field trying to walk across to the street to get to the campus. And on top of that, put the heads of schools in a position where Santa Barbara can compete in terms of a very, very robust STEM program for these kids, which, which is now almost non-existent in, in the high schools. With that, Punitive damages, compensatory damages. You know, we've talked about if these pipelines break or if the equipment breaks. No one gave the thought to saying how much could be extracted from that in terms of making this a very, very painful experience for Exxon in terms of that. Transition plan. Exxon, guess what? We're going to let you turn on the rigs for 10, 15, 20 years. However, here's the specific transition plan in terms of how they're going to turn off. Here's what you're going to do in terms of biodiversity for the county. Here's where we're going to have a big conversation regarding sequestration, all of which leads to the last thing that nobody, nobody has made this ask, and it's an incomprehensible to me. Exxon, when that facility is running, generates so much power. Okay, there's power that they create as a function of that. That power, like I use this cheeky quote, Jerry. Nobody in Saudi Arabia pays $5 a gallon for gas. Nobody in the Middle East pays $5 a gallon for gas. We have 15 to 25% of the entire energy need of the state of California on those three platforms sitting idle, right there, uh, sitting off offshore. Put that aside. What I would ask them for is put that energy, excuse me, Put that electricity back into the grid. And I'm going to give you specific numbers that you should ask them. You should ask their head of government affairs that you spoke to me and said, Frank Troy says you can put electric power back in the grid and do two things. One, you can indefinitely lower electricity costs for the for Santa Barbara County residents, 25, 50, 75% per annum. And part two, you can support the infrastructure within the grid so we don't have any more reliability issues that everybody's been facing in the county. 
That's the deal that I would negotiate and structure with the help of the community, and ideally through a bipartisan commission to present to the county. And then Jerry, put it to you and say, all right, we, we did a deal with the devil here, but schools are funded. Like the electricity grid is set up. We have a commitment from them in 10, 15 years where everything gets turned off. We have a climate transition plan. Everybody's on the same side of the table. It's a compromise. Nobody's happy, but we, we, we got this over the line. That I would see as my obligation as supervisor to present to you. And then you as a constituent, you can say whether or not that's a good idea or not. But my obligation Look, to you is to present that. Yeah. So at the risk of oversimplifying, just so I understand. So you would have voted no as it was presented. You would have sought a deal with ExxonMobil to get the uh, various uh, goodies that, that you just described. Uh, and then C, you would have put it before the voters. Is that correct? Am I hearing Absolutely. that? Absolutely. You know, okay. and, and we get into the hypocrisy of, you know, DOS liking the valves and not liking the valves. I mean, that was the small ball trade in the entire discussion. You're talking about several hundred million dollars that was sitting there in the middle of the room and nobody talked about it. That was the part about this that was so ironic. And, and again, if, if the county wants to say no to that, I accept that. But but at least try to give the county the best possible structure that they could look at. I mean, just talking about safety valves was incomprehensible. There was the, the large, we used to say there's a larger there there that nobody even looked at. Uh, and the irony is Exxon knows this. They know this. All right, thanks. You, go ahead, Jerry. I think you had another one. You want to go back to back on a... Well, I, I wanted to ask about uh, cannabis uh, because it's uh, obviously been something that's been very... I think divisive for the entire county, but particularly uh, in uh, in District Three, uh, where there have been uh, vintners and others who have been very unhappy about uh, the way that the cannabis ordinance uh, was crafted, the way that it was implemented, and and you know, to me, you know, the big argument was for it. Oh, there's going to be a lot of revenue. Well, there hasn't been a lot of revenue. I mean, they're basically breaking even on the twenty people they had to employ to to just enforce the thing. Uh, what's your take on all that? Is it too late to fix that? Is there a, a fix that uh, would be, uh, uh, you think, welcome to the uh, ears of uh, your uh, would-be constituents or, or what? Jerry, if you can indulge me, let me tell you a quick story. I, I uh, So Josh, to go back to your earlier point, here I am, I was overseas at the time and then realizing that, that marijuana was now part of it. It was a commercial product in the state of California. Whereas in Singapore, they'd hang you for, for, for smoking marijuana. So you can imagine the juxtaposition of what I was managing with the kids every time they came back for the holiday. The, what, what I did do in deference to the folks on the cannabis side was I said, look, I, I, do, I reached out to them and I had a great opportunity. I'm going to keep them nameless. It was one of the larger farms and I had the opportunity where the CEO took me out on the pickup truck. And he began the trip by saying to me, you know, all, you know, we had a lot of dark humor around me running for the office. And he said, look, I got to just be honest with you. We're not going to give you any money. We're not going to support you. We typically, you know, we, we roll up with the Democrats in terms of, of, of what we do. And he said, but I'd like to take you around and I would appreciate a business opinion, you know, relative to what we're doing. So we run around the whole facility. It was very impressive. I mean, and again, it was very awkward for me to actually have pictures to be there in the field and real, you know, whereas before it was completely illegal <laughs> for a left country come back and I was stunned. And as we're driving back to his office, he said, um, so what do you think? And I said, you know, uh, in all truth, we, we probably would be better off going back to your office and really enjoying your, your product and, 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 and doing it for, for a lot. And he knew I was being sarcastic. And he said, we're screwed, aren't we? And I said, you, you are, this is the most horrific industry I have ever seen. Cannabis was something to look at, if we're being brutally honest, five or six years ago. So everybody who is smart got into it and they got out five or six years ago. The only way that industry is going to get, and I told him this, I told him this and, and, and uh, the only way the industry is going to get saved here in the county, and great that there's some tweaks in terms of how it was implemented and so on. It needs a subsidy. It is the worst business. They can, the, these folks now, I, I think, and, and in deference to the folks on the cannabis side, I think they were sold a bill of goods by the county. So it was a bit of a bait and switch in, in terms of what was there. And on top of that, without even getting into the federal issues, that they don't even have access to the same financial systems in terms of the banking sector and investors. But if you, if the two of you came to me and said, do you want to invest in cannabis? No. Uh, and the hard part for the county right now, it's it's a millstone. It will never do what we wanted it to do. I think it's a blemish in, in terms of what's there. And I don't mean this against any of the people in the industry. They're, they're trying the hardest they can, but it's it's not going to work. 
and it's going to require a subsidy and or and this isn't even something where there's a blockbuster of cannabis trade consolidating ugly bad financially poor companies isn't going to work this isn't something where size is going to solve the problem it's all a bad it's all bad because uh, because of the illegal market you mean uh, there are a number of things. One, the county's implementation relative to how it was implemented elsewhere was wrong, if, if we're being blunt. Uh, part two, I think, to your point, the quandary now that it's the product is cheaper on the black market relative to the regulated market. Uh, and I think, you know, we could just stop right there. The, the, they can't win. You know, they can't win. And on the public safety side, you know, what 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 are we going to do? We're going to ask the deputies now to 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 effectively be an extension of enforcement. On, no, that's not going to happen. So these guys, regrettably, they're they're in a lose lose situation. They can't get out of it. And and I, it was funny. I told I was teasing them. I said, look, I, I, I don't have any good news for you here. I said, otherwise, you got to find somebody else who doesn't understand the business and sell them the property and get out of this as quickly as you can, because in my mind, it's worthless. So too much supply and there couldn't possibly be enough demand. No. No, you you and I couldn't watch enough Cheech and Chong movies to make a dent in the supply issue that they that they have. So there there's a, it's a much more fundamental problem. And and the sad part is it's been there for a while, and they know it, and we know it, and 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 I don't see an outcome in terms of how it works to get out of it. Are you proposing to subsidize the cannabis? No, industry? no, no, absolutely not. I think it's a waste of money, absolute waste of money. And so the 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 other little tweak part of this is as some growers, you know, vacate the business and get out. The county keeps, you know, trying to reissue those permits. Shouldn't they begin to take down the number of permits? I, I you know, it's funny. This is one of those rare moments where I sound like a traditional Republican, but, you know, yeah, this is kind of like economics 101 that we took when we were undergrads. I mean, something here needs to change and it's pretty obvious. And and because we're not even engaged, like to your point, Jerry, we're not even engaging in basic price discovery on this. And, and, and so you're, you're absolutely right. There's so much here that, and, and the other, the other challenge too, and I'll get the 800 pound gorilla out of the room. I think the community is having a rough time uh, aligning on, you know, creating demand for this product. And, and I think that's something that privately people talk a lot about where, you know, yes, it would be great if the revenue was there, but at the same time, people still have a moral quandary with what this is. But but here the business is going to fail on its own. You and I don't need to do anything to save it. All right, thanks, uh, Frank. Uh, let me let me go back a little bit and sort of get you to spend some time talking about the state of the local Republican Party. So, you know, you've already said that you're unabashed. You know, you're not going to try to say you're no party preference. You're Republican. You're presenting yourself as you are. Some of the things that had come up was, oh. And this, you know, Darcel told me this in a quote that I used in one of my stories was, oh, the party was unhappy with Frank and he wasn't really resonating. So they, they figured out a way to get Janelle in the race, who's more moderate and conservative. I mean, where, where do you stand in the context of the local Republican Party? Are, are you the unifying candidate? Did they sort of say, well, we kind of like him, but we can't get anyone else? Uh Give me sort of your estimate. I had Justin Shores on my show, and he gave me sort of a overview of kind of the infighting within the Republican Party, or the, you know, the sort of the separate tracks. Uh, talk to me about the party, and where do you fit in this effort? Well, it, 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 and again, I, I appreciate the way you teed it up with Darcel. So I, I, I think she is fantastic at spin. I actually just watched the other day the War Room. I was because it reminded me of some of the old Carville stuff when when Clinton was running and. Like I said, we have the quote board. She's she's not she's not a quarter of the way through, so she's another side seventy five percent that she needs to walk through. Um, let me say something clearly to your point on on, on unifying the party, and and I'm going to bring up a couple things that you guys should feel comfortable leaning into. There, the Republican Party right now has an opportunity to present a voice for the first time, and that my my concern was we had to have a moderate position coming into the selection. And one of the things I made a, a, an ask of the party was to say, we can't be talking about social issues. We can't be talking about the LGBTQ community. We cannot be talking about religion. We can't be talking about January 6th insurrection, et cetera, et cetera. It's not, that's not what the constituents want. And Josh, you give me too much credit saying that I'm a unifier. Uh, I, I, I appreciate that. The reality is deep down, everybody knows the county's broke. 
that's that's the unifying concept. So I, I'm not arrogant enough to believe that everybody likes me. I think what people are appreciating is this is the first time that someone's looked him in the eye and said, we've run out of money. OK, Jerry, back to your point. We can smoke a lot of weed and that's not going to make a difference in terms of revenues here in the state. We need to create revenue in a pragmatic matter for this county. And I think what the party did, which was extraordinary, they aligned around that. All the disparate, disparate voices, the arch conservatives, the moderates, you know, Reagan Republicans. I even, even had guys coming in saying, I'm a Jack Kemp Republican, and I forgot that existed way back when. So here, the party's concern is the fiscal narrative that's there. And 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 which, and if I'm being candid, that's not Republican or Democrat. You know, we're we're talking about basic economic principles here to get the ball over the line. And um I, I hope. At the end of the day, um, the party will will there be some good takeaways. So we've been working with uh, Bobby, who you know, on the California Republican Party in terms of some infrastructure issues and process issues to kind of professionalize things. And and it's whereas initially maybe there was some pushback on the conversations to say, hey, Darcel's built a really good org. Like I'm I'm the laziest guy in the world. I always tell people just copy paste. If somebody you know we used to say on Wall Street, if you have eyes, plagiarize. Darcel's built a phenomenal machine. Just copy that. At a minimum, just copy what she's doing, you know? And, and we don't have a mouthpiece <laughs> like Darcel making comments about the incumbent. We don't, you know, we, we, we don't even have that person yet. But I think the party overall is, is realizing now what's important. And, and again, the, the other part is we, we've agreed that, you know, along the one-term narrative, I, I don't think we're going to need longer than two to three years to fix this, which is why I'm comfortable saying, you know what, second term, Maybe we could start to expand, you know, around some of the other issues that the party would like to talk about. But now it's not the appropriate time. Now, so I know. Are you, a, are you ahead, a Trump guy or a never Trumper? <laughs> so, Jerry, I'm going to I'm going to give you a homework assignment. I want you to Google three words. Troyce. And now, you know, the Ellis Island story of my name. So Troyce, Trump, ambassador. And I want you to, to do that. The I have a very strong opinion about the Trump administration. And I would say that this is one of those moments where Darcel and I might actually agree if, if, if I was being very candid with you. I've been very outspoken regarding my view of the administration. And I had the opportunity to have a role with the administration. And I'll let you Google those words and you can, you can have fun with it. And Jerry, it was funny. The word that I learned, it was my New York Times crossword puzzle word, was uh, lustration, L-U-S-T-R-A-T-I-O-N. And lustration, as it was defined to me, was it was a colleague of mine back in Washington. He's like, you definitely don't want to have anything to do with this administration because of lustration. It was like post-Iraq, nobody who was affiliated with the Ba'ath Party could get a job, period. Yeah, you know, they just, they couldn't find work. And here, I have nothing in common with that administration in terms of anything, you know, that that, that they espouse or believe in. And and uh, so I, I can't say that more clearly. Uh, and, and I think what's interesting, Josh, to go back to your point, Darcel's in a bit of a quandary because that's the first paintbrush she should be painting here. You know, she should be painting that as, as deeply and as quickly as possible. But I think if anybody does even a moment of research, they'll find out that I'm I'm actually more uh, more aligned in terms of, of of a more rational approach than they realize. Thanks. What? Well, let me just. I'm just going to go there, Frank. Um, <laughs> what? The way you've been portrayed, and I know the way the party will portray you. And if it's not in literature, it's going to be face to face when they're knocking on doors is you're a rich white dude from San Inez. And at this time when we need diversity and equity and people with lived experiences who represent, you know, this, this County, this population, how do you overcome that? I hear, I, you know, we're talking to you, we hear you, you're a real person, you know, you're not a Trumpster, but how do you overcome that perception of how they're going to try to frame you when you're running for this office. Well, I, I look, I, in, in that, I use a cliche where I say it's like ice cream on a raincoat. I can't do anything. People can throw ice cream and I'm just going to rinse it off with a glass of water and, and just move on here for the two of you. If you two are the only two people in this County, I would say to you, this election is actually interesting in terms of the choice. On, on the one hand, you have two individuals who are politicians. Uh, neither of them has any pub private sector experience at all. Neither of them, we can go on and on. To me, the incumbent and Janelle, with all due respect, they're the same person in, in terms of the choice. Here, 
if you believe, and it's not a function of belief, I don't mean to give it like a religious tone. If the county's out of money, then I think the, what you want is someone to fix it. And, and let me qualify that, Josh. I'm a big believer in you learn it, earn it, and return it. You know, many people have said to me, well, you're overqualified for the job. Why would you do this? It's not a job to me. This is public service. I'm not doing this as a source of income. Actually, I find this a fascinating puzzle to solve, you know, like the, the whole thing we were just talking about with Exxon. But if the two of you with, with, and Jerry, I say this respectfully, between grandkids and kids, I'm looking you in the eye and saying, if we have a 25, 40, $50 million shortfall, here's six options. Tell me which one you like. The good news for you is the other two candidates aren't even remotely talking about this. They're not even, you know, they're, they're more in a caretaker role as it relates to the county. So I think that's the choice that's there. And, and you know, at, and we could argue, is my background different? Absolutely. I'm not going to shy away from that. But but at the end of the day, I think the county needs someone to get in there and actually address this problem. You mentioned Janelle Osborne. She does no factor at all here. Um, you're glad she's in because it shows another area of geography unhappy with the incumbent. Um, what did you think when she got in at the last minute? Were you like, man, there goes some votes for me? Or you're like, great. Uh, <laughs> Joe, I'm going to win on March 5th. Talk to me about the Janelle Osborne dynamic in this contest. Yeah, there's there's two things that are there. Um, the I'm in the fortunate position that maybe I can be a little bit more honest because I'm not as concerned about political blowback tomorrow. And I think you both understand what I'm saying. What, what I thought was interesting now is with Lompoc being part of the district, you know, why would anyone not want to hear what Lompoc has to say, you know, and, and, and let, let's look at, and I want to talk about two things, if it's okay with you, Josh, I think one is the response from the democratic party to Janelle entering and, and the, you know, that discussion, but let's talk about why it's important. Lompoc really has never had a voice in, in the County, you know, and when we look at how Lompoc has been treated, the, the factor that all of us have somehow accepted homelessness, homicides, you know, the impact that this is having on the families in the community, it, it's, it's, it's uncomfortable. It's uncomfortable for people in San Inez and Goleta to hear this, but this was always there. And, and to Janelle's credit, when you look at the, the job that she took, I mean, what, and Jerry, correct me, what does a mayor make in, in Lompoc? Is it $1,200 a month, $1,500 a month? Maybe, so, maybe, yeah. No. Okay. So, and and I and by the way, Josh, I've spoken with you know I don't want to give you the impression we're great friends, but I, I would say that we've always had a very cordial and respectful conversation. But twelve fifteen hundred dollars a month, which knowing just if you could just go on the videos of the council meetings, she's probably making what twenty cents an hour relative to the time that she's dedicated to this job, it's and at the same as little as a journalist. <laughs> well said, well said. So here, I, I think you have a person who entered into a thankless job. I think prior to that, Janelle was an event planner, you know, so she didn't need to do to go into public service, but she did. She's trying to do the right thing by the community. So the, I think it's important for people to hear that. And you, the three of us all know Janelle. Janelle's not a wilting flower by any means. You know, Janelle definitely has an opinion, which I think is great. And I think the county needs to hear that. And, and it's uncomfortable to hear it. What I was disappointed in and, and it really, really stood out to me was the strong, emotional, visceral reaction that Janelle needed to ask for permission, which astounded me in regards to, and, and, and I'm going to say something here because I, I actually know, um, uh, I'm going to say something here that might make you both uncomfortable. If I had made the comments that Darcel instructed the incumbent to say, if I had made those comments as a man, there would have been a totally different conversation in terms of how utterly condescending they were and disrespectful they were to Janelle. The fact that somebody was saying that Janelle needed to ask for permission to, to do something that as a mature adult in service to her community, that was nobody's decision but her own to, to do that. And she didn't owe anybody anything. She didn't owe anybody a phone call to, to, to do that. So, uh, I, and again, I, I kudos to her. And, and, and one of the things that's happening now, just, just so you guys know, We've been working on putting together, because one of the things we wanted to do is get out in the community. So to Janelle's credit, she's like, great, you, you tell me where, let's just keep the conversation focused on the issues. And I'm like, great, people need to hear what, what's going on in Lompoc. Guess who's not showing up? 
Guess who's refused these meetings? Guess who's pushed these meetings? And I should say it's Darcel. Darcel has pushed every one of the forums officially to late January because they don't want the community to hear these conversations until just before the ballots drop in February. So to Janelle's credit, her team has been working with my team. And we said, no, we're going to have, we'll do the, the official events and the incumbent, if she feels safe being in a, in a kind of sheltered environment with a tighter news cycle. But we're going to do these forums in the, actually, we're doing one this Wednesday, I think, in, in Lompoc. And and uh, uh, in fact, I think Darcel is showing to the event in lieu of the candidate showing up to the event. So Darcel now has become the proxy. And and uh, in fact, one of our guys was saying, it's almost like weekend at Bernie's. You know, they, they, they could have put anybody in that chair as the incumbent and had them show up. But what Janelle's doing, I think, is very, very important for the people at Lompoc. You got anything else, Jerry? I'm done. I'm going to last thing. Well, hold on, Frank. Um, sure. We're going to let you wrap up here in a second, but I want to go back to your first point. You're going to win by March 5th? That's yeah, a thank bold you. statement. Tell us how you're going to do that. You know, and Josh, thank you. And I'm, I'm, I'm glad you, you're, you're kind of holding my feet to the fire. Um, so as you guys know, based on the background that I have, a, a big, big part of my constituent base are the folks in public safety. And, and I would say this, even though publicly they're not supporting the campaign, but even the folks in fire. And in, in terms of what they do, I'm a New York public school kid coming from a family of cops and firemen. So these folks are very, very close to me in terms of, of, of what they do. When we were going into year end um, and I was looking at this and again, I, I could bore you guys with the polling numbers and, and, and everything later. What stood out to me was one, we have the juxtaposition of, you know, our platform being revenue. The other two candidates aren't talking about it at all, you know, impacts to, to, to the community and so on. But two things over the holidays stood out to me and actually caused me to take a breath and say, you know what, maybe we need to think about this differently. Because for me, this is public service, not public job. It's not public political career. It's public service. Two things happen. And Jerry, I think you know one of these constituents better than me. You guys familiar with the San Inez Valley Community Outreach folks, Pam Neckow's group up here in San Inez? Great nonprofit group. Terrific nonprofit group. What they do for the community in terms of food banks, uh, domestic abuse, uh, support for the veterans, it's just incredible work. This is a group that needs maybe fifty dollars to $100,000 and they'd be fine. Okay, they, They're not going to get it. So they're not getting it now from the county and with the county having the budget cuts, they're, they're certainly not going to get it uh, going forward. And here during the holidays to see that was hard because uh, I was over there quite a bit looking at, at what they were doing for the community. But the other statistic that stood out to me you guys know what the number one death and cause of death in the county is, correct? It's fentanyl overdoses. So when we look at what's happening now in fentanyl, there's going to be somewhere between 10 to 15 overdoses a month, if we look at it statistically. And there's going to be somewhere between one to one and a half homicides in Lompoc, okay, over that course of time. Now, because of what I do day to day, I always look at things from the context of, well, what's the opportunity cost? What are we really talking about? So for all the drama about Janelle and the incumbent, for all, you know, Josh, back to your point, we, we, we can take this offline, you know, could we be doing some really cool things in terms of micro-targeting and negative campaigning with AI and creating avatars of the incumbent regarding, you know, whatever? Absolutely. We could, we could have a field day in terms of that. The hard reality is between now and March 5, there's going to be 20 to 30 people who won't be here, all right, between fentanyl overdoses and homicides in Lompoc. If this goes to November, we're looking at 100 to 150 people dead, period. Okay, we know this in, in terms of what's there. So here's what I'm proposing that the county think about. I don't think we should be facing these type of trade-offs. To me, it's unacceptable. And if we look at our solution, I am not comfortable looking the public safety folks in the eye and saying, I'm coming to you with 30 to $50 million of revenue, but you're not going to get it because... You know, you look at the battle the sheriff's having right now, just to, he's he's been adamant to the county in terms of these fentanyl overdoses, in terms of what they're doing. You look at the jeopardy that we're putting the police in, in terms of, you know, in Lompoc, the chief of police, he's at 50 percent of his staffing. The Lompoc public safety folks are pulling off a miracle in terms of what those ladies and gentlemen have, have been doing. And the, as we were doing this, the tragedy in this, I was talking with the team and I said, I'm not comfortable with 100, 150 people being dead when we know we have the money. We know we have the money to fix this. Then you go back, Josh, the article that you guys just published. 48 hours later, we had that shooting at the Circle K in Lompoc. 
where the gunman went in, he robbed the store at gunpoint. I think it was at 11 p.m. He left. Two hours later, he went back to the same store at gunpoint with complete impunity and was regrettably uh, in an altercation with, with the law enforcement and, and perished that evening. And I said, you know what, we're not, we're not doing this. We're, we're not, this needs to be done by March 5. So here, here for you guys is the scoop. Here's the story that you can put out as, you, as your lead for the article. If your listeners agree with me and the platform, I'm asking them two things. Show up for the forums. Let my team know. Neil Gowing of the Deputy Sheriff's Association will be there. That is my main constituency. You tell Neil Gowing we support. We want him to stay in the race. And by the way, every dollar that we give the campaign, we're going to give a dollar to the San Inez Valley Community Outreach. So, you know, 25 to them, 25 to me, and that's absolutely fine. However, and Josh, I'm appealing to you and Jerry as voters. If you disagree, if you say, you know what, Frank, we love you, but we don't see you as the Trader Joe's guy, but, but we agree with the platform, you tell me which one of the candidates to support. You tell me whether or not it's the incumbent. You tell me whether or not it's Janelle. And as long as they agree and can agree to look the folks at public safety in the eye and say, we know that we agree with the revenue platform. We agree with all the tenants that, that have been proposed. This election will be done by March 5. I will be the loudest supporter of the candidate that supports the platform for revenue. I am not willing to accept 100 to 150 overdose slash homicide deaths by November, and I'm certainly not going to accept 20 or 30 by, by March 5. So that that there is why we're, we're not gonna continue this past March 5. And, and you know, it's interesting, and I'm gonna say something really hard here, Josh. Mm -hmm. Darcel dug Bruce a really, really hard hole. And again, I appeal to your Democratic voters listening to this. Not only did Darcel throw the climate agenda out the door with the pipeline, Darcel embraced a January 6th insurrectionist who was just arrested. Darcel grabbed someone from the far right and forced the incumbent to say to do some horrific political horse trading to put that together. So I would say to Darcel, if you're really serious about doing the right thing for the county, forget about dealing with people who are now arrested and fighting a battle with the DOJ. This is simple. Just look the DSA right in the eye with us, Darcel. Look them right in the eye and say, we agree with the revenue platform that, that you guys have. And we are more than happy to support your candidate or which which either one of the two. Otherwise, we'll continue the race and, and it'll be done by March 5. Wow. OK, well, Frank, wow, what an amazing conversation. We are at time. Um, and so I appreciate uh, everything that you had said and your bluntness, your honesty. And uh, I think this is a good time to wrap up. Uh, Jerry, I appreciate your time. Great questions. Frank, I was going to say we'll be talking all year, but maybe we're only going to talk through March 5th and, you know, then it'll be a different, different context. We'll see. But we thank only you got so a few much. more weeks. Only a few more weeks, Josh. Well, thank you so much, Frank. Take care. Good luck. Take care. Thank you, guys. See you. Bye-bye.